Get your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter 3. That's where we will uh, be studying tonight. Trying to uh, secure a, a better knowledge and appreciation for this, for this letter. Um, and what, what an incredible letter that it is. We spent our time last week looking at a good portion of ch- uh, chapter 2, which I think is some of the richest uh, portion anywhere in the Bible, especially verses 5 through 11. When it talks about what Jesus gave up in order to come to this earth. And the book of Philippians, written by Paul while he is a prisoner in in Rome. And yet it's a book that is full of joy and rejoicing, which we have seen and which we will continue to see here uh, in chapter 3 as we study it together. Paul's been dealing somewhat in some generalities up to this point, um, at at least specifically regarding the lives that these Christians needed to live. He had been talking in general terms about the the attitudes they needed to have, about the spirits that needed to be uh, uh, represented, about the unity that they needed to strive for. Uh, But he seems to get a little more specific when we get to chapter 3, at least more specific regarding some certain folks. So let's pick up in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1 where Paul says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. He says that here, he said it before, and he's going to say it before we get to the end of the letter. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. Is it okay to say the same thing more than once? I guess if you're saying the same thing, you'd be saying it more than once, right? Is that redundant? Is it okay to say the same thing more than once? Yes or no? Of course, husbands are going to say, no, just tell me once and that's enough, right? You don't have to say it over and over. Is it okay? Do we have Bible to say it's okay to say it more than once? Paul says it. Peter writes and says it. Did Jesus ever say say something more than once? Or did he just say it one time? Um, So it's okay to repeat things because Paul says it's not tedious, not for me, but he says for you it is safe. What does that mean? Not tedious to write the same things to you. Because for you, it is safe. Safe in what regard? In case you didn't get it the first time. Sometimes it's beneficial to hear it again because you didn't hear it to begin with. And for them, it would be safe to make sure that they are not, uh, they're not tripped up by some things that maybe they didn't catch the first time or some warnings that they weren't certain about. Because he goes into that in verse 2, and he says, beware of dogs. What kind of dogs? I mean, we're talking Doberman pinchers. We're talking uh, gerbils, or not gerbils, but what are those little uh, ankle biters? Um, uh, Chihuahuas, yeah, that's that's the one. Uh, I mean, what, what kind of beware of dogs are we talking about here? Huh? Pharisee dogs. What'd you say, Jerry? Wolves. These would be. Uh, uh, look, look back in Matthew 15. You, you want to see? Uh, you want to see Jesus use this word? Look back in Matthew. Hold your finger in Philippians 3 because we're we're doing a quick trip over here and we're coming right back. Uh, Matthew chapter 15. What verse? Well, let's see. There's only 39 of them. Verse 21, Jesus went out from there, departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and behold, a woman, this is Matthew 15, 22, a woman of Canaan, came from that region and and cried out to him, and his disciples told him in verse 23, send her away, for she cries out after us. Just get rid of her. Jesus answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. What's he talking about? She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then he answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be as you desire. What's he talking about? That something would be given to the dogs. Go back a few chapters. Say again, Freddie. Yes. 
the Gentiles were referred to by the Jews as dogs. So is that what Paul's saying? Beware of the Gentiles. That would be kind of um, unexpected, wouldn't it? Who's he talking about? As, uh, as who said Pharisee dogs? Chuck did, right? Beware of these dogs. Why, why, why are they referred to as dogs? Well, it's a play on words. One, because the Pharisees referred to other people, including the Gentiles, as dogs. And yet God is saying, uh-uh-uh, we need to beware of you. Because what are they doing? Beware of evil workers. Here they are doing, uh, doing their various works. And no doubt they think that they are good works. And yet God says, these aren't works of righteousness. Beware of evil workers. They might think that their works are works of righteousness, but they're not. Beware of the mutilation. Beware of the mutilation. What is that? What was it that the Pharisees, and let's, let's be more specific than that. What was it that the Judaizing teachers that, that uh, bothered Paul and confronted Paul so frequently, what is it that the Judaizers were trying to bind on Christians? Circumcision. Circumcision. In Acts chapter 15, they were, they were teaching, unless one is circumcised according to the law of Moses, he cannot be saved. There were these Judaizers who were trying to take the old covenant and to mesh it with the new covenant and say, you have, unless you're circumcised according to the old law, you cannot be saved. So they're trying to bind circumcision and God says, beware of the mutilation. It's a play on words, as you might expect. Why would he say beware of the mutilation? What were they doing? By trying to bind something from the old law. They were, in effect, mutilating the will of God. They were dogs. They were evil workers. They were given over not to some clean cut in a circumcision, but to just a mutilation of the person. Is that graphic? I mean, you think about... Uh, the, the nature of that warning, um, you know, God could have just said, beware of those people who, uh, who say things that are not right and do things that are not good. Right? Could have said that. And it would have worked. But he's very specific, very graphic in this regard. But he says in verse 3, for we, Christians, we are the circumcision now, why would he, we Christians are the circumcision? What's that about? It's hard for us to put ourselves into the, into the setting. When you go back and try to put yourself in the first century, and you have this Jewish influence, and influence is just an understatement, you have this Jewish influence in the church that expects you to be following after certain traditions from the old school, from the old law, just because that's been our way of life. What was the sign that was given to Abraham? The, the sign of the covenant that God gave to Abraham was circumcision. When they were circumcised, what did that do, what did that do for their relationship with God? Say again. It, it put them into a covenant with God by that act, by that outward act. Now Paul says, we Christians are the circumcision. Not talking about an outward act. He's, he's using a play on, word, it's, it's using metaphorical, figurative language to say, we are now God's covenant people. The old law, you had to be circumcised in order to be in a covenant with God. We are the circumcision now, not because of an outward act, but because of an inward change and because of a change of life, because of a devotion to God. We are now that, flip back a few pages. Go to, go to uh, Galatians chapter 6. We'll go somewhere close. 
Galatians chapter 6. You want to see, you know what, while we're in Galatians, you want to see another place where God, where God uses that same graphic kind of language? Maybe you don't, but look in, uh, look at verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 11. Remember that the book of Galatians is, uh, is Paul's, uh, Paul's look at the fact that the old law has been done away with. And that this law is no longer binding that schoolmaster he talks about in chapter 3. We're no, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. And so he spends time throughout the book discussing that. He says in chapter 5 verse 11, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. I could wish that those who trouble you even would do what? I, w I could wish that those who trouble you would even cut themselves off. Let your mind wonder, and that's about as graphic as you're going to get in the Bible. Here they are preaching circumcision. Paul says, let them go a little bit further with that act if they think that's really what's going to, uh, to make them right in the eyes of God. Um, go to chapter 6. Verse 13 is uh, uh, verse 12. Where, how far do I go back? Verse 12. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these Judaizers who want you to be circumcised, these would compel you to be circumcised only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. They're binding this on you, but they're not keeping the law. They, they just want this one thing. They desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Our boasting doesn't need to be in anything but the cross, he says in the next verse. Verse 15, Christ neither, uh, in Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. Here's what I want us to see in verse 16. And as many as walk according to this rule, according to the rule of Christ, not the rule of the old law, according to the rule of Christ, Christians who walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Who's that? Peace and mercy be upon the Israel of God. Put yourself in the, in, in the, put yourself in the, in the setting, especially in the book of Galatians, where he's, where he's dealing with the relationship between Christ and the Jews, between the Jews and the new law, and how the Jews said, we're, we're, we're of Abraham. We're of the seed of Abraham. If you're of the seed of Abraham, that means you're of the seed of Isaac, and you're also of the seed of... Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So if I'm of the seed of Abraham, then I'm of the seed of Israel. That makes me special in the eyes of God. And Paul spends the book of Romans, spends the book of Galatians to say, no. You've got to be walking according to the rule, verse 16, of Christ to have peace and to have mercy. And that comes upon the Israel of God. That's not talking about the Jews. It's not talking about those in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's talking about God's spiritual Israel. It's God talking about the church. So come back over to Philippians chapter 2. And I, I, don't, want the, I don't want to make this too confusing uh, or go into this too much. But that's what he's talking about in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3. He warns them about these Judaizing teachers in verse 2 who want nothing other than the circumcision, but then he turns around in verse 3 and says, that's who we are. We are God's spiritual Israel. We are the circumcision. What do we do? We worship. It's an interesting word there. Um, how do we usually define worship? How do, what do we, when we talk about worshiping God, how do we usually define that? Uh, in a graphic way, how do we often say that what is worship? Falling down and kissing the ground in the direction of the one being worshipped. That's, that's how we define worship. We define worship in that way because there is a Greek word for worship that is proskuneo. Well, you hear the, word, you hear the, pre, the prefix pros, you're down. It, it, it's, it's prostrate, kind of in the garden kind of thing. You're down in a worshipping mode, you're proskuneo. That's not the word here, though. 
So th this is not the falling down, kissing the ground. This is the Greek word. It's a different Greek word, latru, and it simply means to serve. We are God's spiritual Israel. Do we worship him? Yes. Do we proskuneo? Yes. Do we fall down and bow down? Yes. But that's, this is interestingly a different word. We are the ones who serve him. We are his servants. We serve God in the spirit. We glory in Christ Jesus. We don't glory in the flesh. And that's the contrast that he's trying to draw is to say we glory in Christ. We don't, the rest of verse 3 says we don't have confidence in the flesh. We're not concerned about keeping the law, and that's not where our confidence is. Our joy is in glorying in Christ Jesus. Paul says, though, if you want, if you want, to, if you want to glory, if you want to have confidence in the flesh, nobody can have more confidence in the flesh than me. If you want to look at fleshly accomplishments... Paul says, if you want to look at somebody who kept the law and lived by the law, if you want to see somebody who was rewarded by the law and by those who were keeping the law, you're not going to get a better example than me. And that's what he begins in verse 4. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Look at how deep Paul was into Judaism. Verse 5. He was circumcised the eighth day. What does that mean? Well, that means he wasn't a convert to Judaism. He was born a Jew. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He's not grafted in later. He is of original uh, stock of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Does that matter? What, what, what was different? What was unique about the tribe of Benjamin? Small? Is that what you said? Saul was from the tribe... King Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. Where did this Saul get his name? From the King Saul, who was of the tribe of Benjamin. Here's another Saul that's of the tribe of Benjamin. Um, when, the, uh, when the kingdom was divided, when Solomon died, when the kingdom was divided, you had ten tribes that were in the north, you had two tribes that went to the south. You have Judah down there, and the tribe of Judah is obviously descendants of uh, the uh, son of Jacob named Judah, through whom the lineage of Christ would come. Uh, David was of the tribe of Judah, and so we, we know Judah down there, but what was the second faithful tribe down south? Benjamin. And so you have the division of the tribes, and yet the only faithfulness that exists in the divided kingdom was down south. And Benjamin was a part of that. Uh, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. What does that mean? What were his parents? Were they mixed? Were Timothy's parents mixed? Timothy had a Jewish mother, Greek father. Was Timothy a Hebrew of the Hebrews? Uh-uh. Mixed heritage. Both of his parents Hebrews. Concerning the law, Paul was a Pharisee. Would that be a compliment? In, their world. Pharisees hope so. <laughs> In the Jewish world, being a Pharisee was something. Yeah, especially if you were a Pharisee, it was the, it was the only thing. But they, they, they were one of the uh, they were one of the sects of the Jews in which one of the premier groups among them. And so if you were any here he was. Concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, the next verse, what was he doing? How strong of a Jew was Paul? Was he a pacifist? No. Was he just, you know, well, you know, if those Christian people want to be there, if, if they want to be saying that we don't have the law anymore, and if they want to say that this Jesus guy got rid of the law, all right, well, just let them do what they want to do. Is he a pacifist? Whew, No. Concerning my zeal for the law, what did he do? Persecuting the church. Killing Christians. That's how strongly he believed in the old law. Concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul was held up. He was revered among his peers, uh, among his fellow Jews. When you look at Paul's life prior to Christianity, what did he have? 
In, in, in the Jewish mind, what did he have before he became a Christian? He had it all. He, he's, he's, he's your premier example. He's the one you would hold up as your jewel. And so he says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, I had all of this. And, and that word gain is in a tense that just means I had it and I, keep, I kept on having it and it kept on coming and I, it just it kept on feeding me and it was my life. But those things that were gained to me, what did he do? He counted them loss for Christ. What did Paul give up to serve Christ? He gave up everything he was brought up with. He brought up everything that he gave up everything that he knew. What, when Paul became a Christian, what difference did it make that he was circumcised on the eighth day? Of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. What difference did it make when he became a Christian? Zero. Did not matter. What did it matter that he was blameless concerning the law, concerning the righteousness that was in the law? Didn't matter. How, you think about what Paul gave up to become a Christian. How much do we give up when we become a Christian? How much is there of our former life that God calls upon us to lose? That word lose, the things that were gained to me, I counted as loss for Christ. What did Jesus say about losing your life? Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, gain it. Did Paul lose his life for the sake of Christ? Everything he knew, everything he had? When Paul became a Christian, think about Acts chapter 9. Paul becomes a Christian. And we're not told all of the specifics about this, but when he became a Christian, did the Christians want anything to do with him? Nope. Afraid of him. Well, he just became a Christian. You think the Jews wanted to have anything to do with him? Uh, Jews, or, or Paul is on an island by himself. He becomes a Christian, and all of a sudden, all of this that he had gained, all of this that was his, oh, that's gone. And everybody that was in that circle with me, oh, I, I've totally turned my back on them. He doesn't have them. He turns to the Christians. Christians are afraid of him. At first, Paul is on an island by himself. Except who's on the island with him, David? The Lord is there with him. Never was he by himself. So look at what the verse says. These things that were gained for me, I counted them as loss for what? For Christ. When he said earlier in the book, for me to live is Christ. This is what it's all about. And he said, I was willing to give up everything for Christ. Yet indeed, and, and it almost seems like he's repeating himself in here. Yet indeed, verse 8, I also count all things. There were those things that were gained to me before. And, and if it wasn't included in that, then anything else that might be out there. Any kind of prestige I may have had, any kind of popularity that I may have had, any kind of wealth uh, that I may have attained, uh, any kind of uh, whatever, I count all things. And the word count there is in the present tense. It wasn't that he just at one time said, well, okay, I'll put that stuff aside. It was that he was continually counting. I, I just cons I'm considering all the time all things lost. There's the word again. Lost in verse 17. I count them lost now, all things, for what? Verse 7 says he did it for Christ. Now he says, I count them lost for what? New King James says, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Anybody have something different than the excellency of the knowledge of Christ? Jerry, what does New American Standard say? Or Tim, or somebody who's got New American Standard. I count all things lost in verse 8. For what purpose did he count them lost? Joyce, you got it? Yes, 
In the, the, King, the New King James says, I count them lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. New American Standard says, I count them lost. Why? Because in the, I want the, does it say surpassing value? Is it the word value there? For the surpassing value of the knowledge of Christ. Is there anything better than the knowledge of Christ? Paul says there is the excellency, New King James, there is the surpassing value of it. And this is not just a knowledge where I, I know he was born in Nazareth, or born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. I know that he did this, and I know... It's not factual knowledge. This knowledge, the Greek word here, is about a personal acquaintance with them. And Paul says, if I can have that personal acquaintance with the Son of God, if I can have the excellency of that knowledge, I don't care what else I can have. I count it all loss. I'll get rid of everything. If I can just have the knowledge of Christ. Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom, verse 8, he says, I have suffered the what? The loss. It's the third time he's used the word loss here. For Christ Jesus, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them, there's that word again, he used it in verse 7, I count them as loss. He used it at the beginning of verse 8, count all things for loss. And now all of these things that he has lost, look at it in verse 8, the end of it. I count them as, what word do you have? Rubbish. Dung. All of those things I had before. All of those things who made, that made me somebody. All of those things that excelled me to, to a position of prestige and power in Judaism. All of those things that made people look up to me. All of those things that, that made me who I thought I wanted to be. Paul says, I not only count them as loss, it's not that I'm just writing them off. Well, I don't have to have them anymore and I write it off. I consider those things to be refuse, you might have in your translation, rubbish, you might have in your translation, dung. Do you got the picture? Graphic. Those things are not just something that are meaning less to me. Those things are now disgusting to me. When we become a Christian... And the Bible says that we repent, that we turn. The ways of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The ways of the world, those lusts that war against our soul. What should be my view of those things? Should I just say, well... No, I, I, I don't need that anymore. And just kind of brush it to the side? Or should it be that which disgusts us? Because we know it only brings separation from God. It's very graphic how Paul views the change that had come about in his life. And no doubt it had to be meaningful to these Christians to hear, if Paul could give up all of that, what can I not give up? And for you and me, if Paul was willing to, to flip his life upside down and everything that he thought was right is now wrong and everything he thought was wrong is now right, you know, you flip it upside down. If Paul was willing to count all things lost, for, what is there that I cannot count as loss in order that I might come to Christ, in order that I might come to the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, the end of verse 8 says, in order that I might gain Christ. Could you gain Christ if you had not lost those things to begin with? You see the balance that takes place here? There are those things that fill up my life. And I have all of these things that fill up my life. If I don't lose these things, am I going to have room to gain Christ? Well, I'll just stick Christ in there with the rest of it. No, you don't gain Christ that way. I've got to lose these other things so that I can gain Christ, verse 9 says, so that I can be found in Him. See the lost and found? I lost some things so that I could be found. You think about our lives. 
You think about what uh, the priorities that we have. You think about the priorities that our friends have and that our family has. How do we view the world? James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? If I don't count all of these things as loss and I still try to keep some of them in my life as my friends, how does God view that? Is God willing to, to ride side by side with, with those other things in our life? You know, is, is, is he willing to have a little bit of the world in us and a little bit of him? And, you know, as long as we get maybe 51% of God and 49% of the rest, as long as he's got the better, the better, you know, equation there, is he okay riding alongside? Friendship with the world is enmity with God. Strong language, David. David says, if you're clinging to any of those old things um, when you were supposed to have repented and were baptized, then, then you really didn't repent of them. You know, that, when we look at the plan, God's plan of salvation, sometimes we say this, maybe, maybe not often, we must believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. Which one of those is the hardest to do? We think baptism because, you know, there's a lot of people who say you shouldn't be baptized. So we say, well, baptism, that must be the hardest thing to do because it's hard to convince people to be baptized. What's the hardest thing to do? To change. You know how much you hate change. And this change that we're supposed to make before we become a Christian is a change where I say, I'm wrong. That's something you gladly say all the time, right? That's something you freely and willingly and joyfully say all the time. I'm wrong. We, we, don't, we don't like to admit that. And we're, we're to say to God, God, I am dead wrong. And if I keep doing this, I'm going to go to hell. I've got to change. Is it easy to change a job? Is it easy to change where you live? Is it easy to change a tire? Is it easy to change? I mean, you think about all the things that we might change, and we don't, we don't want to do it. You know, is it easy to change the color of your house, the inside or the outside? Why don't you repaint your house every month? Who wants to do that? You know, it, it, just leave it the way it is. That's easier, right? And that's what we want to do with our lives, just leave it the way it is. What if Paul had that mentality? You know, God, oh, man. If I become a Christian, I can't do this, and I got to stop doing this, and I won't be able to teach this, and I want uh, God. I, uh, I'm not God. If I give this up, it's just going to be like flipping it upside down, and I got to give up everything. Yep. Yeah. Ro Romans chapter six says it so well. In so many of the verses there, where verse 4 says that we were baptized and we were raised to walk in newness. Not oldness or, or a little bitness or newness of life. Um, you know, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, those who are in Christ are a new. They were different. But then June points out verse 6 in Romans chapter 6, it says, Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. That old man that was living that old life was crucified with him. What does that mean? He's dead. He, he was destroyed. He was to be crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with. When somebody's crucified and they die, what do you do with them? You bury them. What's supposed to happen to our body of sin? We crucify it, we kill it, we put it to death, and we bury it. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. If I bury it, I don't want it anymore. Why is that so hard? It is hard. Why is that so hard? Dirk? Dirk? 
Yeah. Uh, you know, Dirk says it's, it's a matter of perspective. It's, it's changing it to see that these things belong to God, not to me. This life belongs to God, not to me. L look at what Paul says. Go back to Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, where he says, I count all of this as loss, that I might gain Christ, verse 9, that I might be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness that is from God by faith. I'm not concerned about my own righteousness. Paul talked in Romans chapter 10 about his fellow brethren and said, My heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Well, that's what he's saying in Philippians chapter 3. Is if I seek after my own righteousness, I cannot at the same time seek after the righteousness of God. It doesn't work that way. So he says there's a righteousness that comes from God. And it comes from God when I have faith. And it comes, through, and it comes by that faith, verse, uh, verse 9, uh, be, because that when it's conditional when it comes by faith. And I want to do all of this. I want to give up all of this stuff. I want to count these things as lost. Verse 10. So that I may know Him. Same word, know that personal experience, um, that personal acquaintance with Him. That I might know Christ and the power of His resurrection. What does he mean by that second phrase? What, what was it to know the power of of the resurrection of Jesus. Say again. There is life after death. That, that we will be raised just as Jesus was raised. What does it mean? What else does it mean? What else could it mean? To know the power of his resurrection. Absolutely. There's a personal aspect of this for Paul. Because when he was on the road to Damascus, who appeared to him? The resurrected Lord. Did that change his life? The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead changed Paul's life. Who raised Jesus from the dead? God did. There's the power that was behind the resurrection and bringing Jesus back to life. And then there's the power that that exhibits in a Christian's life. Carol? Could this be the same thing as uh, Romans 1, 16, where I'm not ashamed of the gospel of, God, of Christ for it's the power of God? Yeah. Salvation isn't the power in his resurrection? The, the power is in his resurrection. Uh, when when uh, Carol quotes Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, what is the gospel of Christ? The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. Does the death of Jesus have any power without his resurrection? Doesn't have any power for him. And it has no power. We have no uh, possibility of salvation without the resurrection of Jesus. He died on the cross and he shed his blood that it might wash away our sins, but it will not wash away our sins if he was not raised from the dead. And that's, that's what he says in 1 Corinthians 15. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to know, and this is strange, I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul said, not that I'd be willing to, or if I had to, I would deal with, but he says, I want to know. I want to share in his sufferings. How much did the suffering of Jesus mean to Paul? Jesus suffered for me. I want to suffer for him too. And notice that there's an S interesting on the word suffering. Not just a suffering. His sufferings being conformed to his death. 
Christ's life was taken from him. Was Paul willing to have his life taken from him? I'll be conformed to his death. If that's what's required, I will gladly be conformed to his death if, by any means, if at all possible, not, not that it wouldn't be possible, but this is a humble statement, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. God, I will, you have done all for me, and I will count everything about my life, my life as loss. I will give it all up if I can just be found in Christ. And if I can be raised from the dead, not to have to spend an eternity in hell, but to go and to be with Christ, which is what he's going to talk about in that next section. We'll pick up next week in, in, chapter, in verse 12 and uh, finish out this chapter. But to read through this book, read through this chapter several times. Try to imagine Paul's writing this to you and what it would mean uh, if he did that. Thank you all for your participation tonight.